the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to Islam. Historically, from the time of its beginning, Islam, the Holy Quran, which is the divine revelations to the Prophet Muhammad, and the Prophet himself have all been subjected to various kinds of criticism and ridicule. Many such examples are recorded in the Quran and the record of the Prophet's life. From the sword of the crusader to the pen of the orientalist or western scholar, consistent efforts have been made towards attacking Islam. More recent examples of the events that have unfolded following the sale of Salman Rushdie's book only highlight the need to understand Islam better. A recent article in the LA Times by Dr. John Crossley, Jr., Associate Professor of Religion at USC, titled, Rushdie's is only an early voice in Islam's evolutionary rediscovery of its origins, is, subject, is the subject of our discussion today. Let's join our guests, Dr. John Crossley, Jr., Dr. Nazir Kaja, and Dr. Maher Hatut. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here. Uh, Dr. Crossley, your recent article in the Los Angeles Times entitled Rushdie uh, is only an early voice in Islam's evolution, evolutionary rediscovery of its origin. Um, uh, what made you write this article? Well, I think primarily it was because I was very concerned with the, um, the anger of the American people over um, the Ayatollah Khomeini's uh, death sentence against Rushdie that while I share that anger myself, I also wanted to say that uh, this should not be an occasion for directing wholesale anger against the uh, Muslim community. And then it's also something I've felt for a long time, and um, this provided the occasion to say it, namely that there's a great deal of um, scholarship going on right now about the origins of Islam, and. Um, and I don't think uh, that the American people in general are really aware of that. And what I said about Islam <coughs> being on the, uh, on the edge of rediscovering its own historical origins, I think is true. So I wanted to draw that comparison between what went on in the 19th century with Judaism and Christianity, especially in Germany and France, but eventually in the U.S., and uh, what may be beginning um, in the next uh, decade or few decades with Islam. Well, uh, obviously this article uh, has been read and interpreted by different people in different ways, and I hope, hopefully with Dr. Hatut's help and with your clarification, we will explore this. Uh, going back <coughs> to, the, to the opening of the article, uh, you talk about uh, the birth of, uh, uh, of Jesus. Uh, in your opinion, was this a virgin birth, or you alluded to it in the opening of the in the opening sentence of the article? How do you feel about it? Well, I think what <coughs> what um, Jewish and Christian scholarship have shown is that whatever the virgin birth means, that's not an historical description of the way that Jesus was born. Mm -hmm. As a matter of historical fact, we do not know how Jesus was born. The obvious um, common sense conclusion to draw is that he was born of ordinary parents, just as you and I mm -hmm. were. And it's been, I think, what's happened through critical scholarship is to understand that the virgin birth is a symbol or a doctrine that arises because the early church wanted to express both the uh, humanity of Jesus mm -hmm. and that he was something extraordinary, something special and this was a vehicle to do it. But if you ask me bluntly about it, only two of the four Gospels in the New Testament mm -hmm. have the virgin birth. Uh, John and Mark say nothing about it. And Paul, who is the earliest writer in the New Testament and who has written uh, Romans and First and Second Corinthians and so on, is apparently totally unaware of the tradition and simply assumes Jesus' human birth. Right. So I'd say that the preponderance of historical evidence is that Jesus was not born of a virgin. Yes. Uh, Dr. Hatut, the, the Quran alludes to also the, the birth of Yeah, Jesus. I'd like to, to comment from, although I'm not a historian, but from a historical point of view and from, uh, let us say, a theological point of view uh, as a Muslim. Uh, when we look into the, the works of those who said uh, 
No, the virgin birth is, is not a historical fact or it might be interpreted in a, in a different way. They didn't prove that beyond a doubt either. I mean, there is no solid proof that this didn't happen uh, because they are discussing a case that took place uh, about 2,000 years ago and it would be impossible to prove beyond a doubt from a pure Descartian historical analysis that, that, this, ha that did, this didn't happen. Of course, for me as a Muslim, I would subscribe then in the absence of evidence to the otherwise to what the Quran said, which uh, the Quran emphasized the virgin birth of Jesus as the direct order of God, indicating that he is special. But he is not, of course, in our uh, creed. He is not uh, the son of God, uh, per se, and uh, is not divine. He is the word of God, so to speak. And uh, uh, Dr. Crossley, mm -hmm. you seem to indicate that it was uh, around the 19th century that, uh, um, that the dogmatic uh, side of Christianity and Judaism was sort of prevailed upon by this by the scholarly mm -hmm. scholarly class or uh, scholarly group and uh, your premise is that uh, Islam has yet not had its 19th century and uh, right. I, I just want uh, uh, you to, to sort of clarify that from uh, our point of view or from the Muslim point of view as we read your article and as we hear you talk it seems that uh, the science of, of, of the Bible itself has gone through an evolutionary process and mm -hmm. you, this is what you are referring to. Yes. Um, uh, and we will talk about Quran in this light and hopefully we will have... Yeah, I'd like to comment on that also uh, to, later. To, mm -hmm. to come into it. But... Uh, uh, well, what I, the way I see it is this. I see that um, in the 18th century, the century that the West calls the Enlightenment, this is the period of Lessing and Leibniz and Kant and of uh, mm -hmm. Voltaire and Rousseau and of Locke and Hume and Hobbes and so on. There was a tremendous rationalistic criticism of anything having to do with miracle yeah. whatsoever. And uh, the church and the synagogue too became extremely defensive about this. Some of it got into a corner and came out um, uh, just more orthodox than ever, you might say. And, uh, and some people caved in and said, oh, well, th all these uh, traditions of miracles, such as the virgin birth or the resurrection of Jesus, are um, myths that cannot be substantiated by modern reason. So in the 19th century, what happened was really an aftermath of the critical enlightenment, where the church and the synagogue asked themselves, well, just exactly what do we have? And um, all kinds of It seems to me uh, that that is still within. going on. The, the oh, it is still going on. Right. It is still going on. And I say in the article that that has won the day. But of course, it's won the day only in the scholarly world, right. not necessarily in the popular world. There are plenty of Christians and Jews, too, who um, still abhor the critical reading of the Bible. But in the scholarly world, which is what I live in, I mean, I teach at a university, it's just commonly accepted now that um, we use the historical critical method. And then when I said that Islam has not yet had its 19th century, I would go further and say that Islam has not yet been subjected to the Enlightenment, the totally negative critical uh, uh, period within, simply because for the most part, until recently, Islam has not operated in the West, and there wasn't anything comparable to the Enlightenment in the East or uh, the Near East. Now, it may be that the secularism that contemporary Enlightenment, uh, that contemporary Islam is experiencing is, in a way, its 18th century. It is, in a way, the criticism of Islam. And you get that even in the press. And that's what makes me think that um, because I know some Muslim scholars who are working on precisely these things uh, in a very careful way about the actual historical origins and so on. That's why I think that the time is right for um, a 19th century to begin in Islam. Is, is this uh, a valid uh, assumption? Uh, it is, it is uh, a pleasure to, to disagree with a man of the caliber of Dr. Crosley. 
on uh, on that matter. Uh, the problem in the West, as as I have been a man who is brought up in in the East and the West, the problem of the West is that they assume that because they had their dark ages, that our ages were dark also. We were very enlightened before the enlightenment of Europe. And the, 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 the process of critical criticism and critical research. Critical analysis. And the critical analysis, although it wasn't attributed to Descartes himself, but it was an ongoing thing. For example, Ibn Rushd, uh, way before the Renaissance, did not uh, even uh, accept, uh, almost did not accept the eternity of God. He said that the universe is eternal. Right. And Ibn Rushd was not killed or was That's not right. burned. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, Imam al-Ghazali responded to Ibn Rushd and That's wrote right. the Hafut al-Falasifa right. and they responded back and forth. And uh, you have great uh, Ibn uh, Abu al-Ala al-Ma'ari, who is a great poet and a great philosopher. He was, uh, practically speaking, agnostic because he looked very critically in, uh, in the things that were there. The problem in the West is that they assume that when things were dark here, it was dark there also, and now it is enlightened here and not yet there. Mm -hmm. We did cross this era, and the other problem that, uh, that I see in some Western scholars is that they assume that if you examine the religion and you did not end to the conclusion that it is wrong, so you are not enlightened enough. We don't subscribe to that. We feel that the waves of criticism, as a matter of fact, three waves happened during the collection of the Quran, then in the Abbasi period, at the time of the Ibn Rushd and others, and in the contemporary history, we have a great, great renowned writer like Al-Aqqad in Egypt uh, started by saying, I'll go through the Quran with my red pen. And he ended up by writing the most famous, beautiful books about the Quran, after that critical uh, process. Taha Hussein, who said that the whole story of uh, Abraham and the sacrifice and the whole thing is uh, a drama, an imaginary drama. And uh, people objected on him, not because only of what he said, but because he was the head of the university. And they said he will interject this as programs. And this was the debate. But Taha Hussein, after that, became the minister of education in Egypt. So we were, compared to the West, very enlightened. We went through a very critical process of evolution. And what happened is it ended by the majority of Muslims settling on the validity of the major sources that they have. I, I, I know that I talk too much, but there is a, a point here that I'd like to interject. The, authentic, the authenticity of the Quran or its validity will never be clearly understood, and I don't mean to be critical to you, Nazir, or to Dr. Crossley, with someone who is not very well versed in the Arabic language. Because there he will know that this is a different type of wording and of style. It is different if you interject a verse of the Quran in any article or in any book, you'll, you'll pick it out uh, immediately. It will stand up, it will stand distinguished. So the, the miraculous nature of the Quran is a matter of reality. It's not a matter of hypothesis or theory. Um, and based on that, I, I disagree that the analysis of Dr. Crossley is ac applicable to the case of Well, Quran. I think maybe this may be the problem I think we are having now. Uh, we are talking about uh, a different uh, mindset, different frame of reference maybe, because in this article, for instance, you talk about uh, uh, a funda fundamentalist view of the Quran and a critical view of the Quran, mm -hmm. uh, as, as, as you allude to. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, may I ask you, what do you define as fundamentalism within Islam? Mm -hmm. uh, or is it the same uh, kettle of fish that we, uh, we see within the Western thought when we are talking about fundamentalists, the uh, Bible thumping uh, uh, from the South? Well, uh, let me try to answer that question and at the same time address uh, oh, some right, of uh, Dr. Right. Uh, Hatut's uh, comments. <coughs> um, first of all, I think the word fundamental and fundamentalism is unfortunate. Mm -hmm. It's a word that actually grows out of the Protestant experience of mm -hmm. the 20th century. And, um, you know, in any word that belongs in a specific context like that, 
is not very applicable even to Catholicism. We very seldom speak of a fundamentalist Roman Catholicism. Mm -hmm. If we did, I suppose it would mean an ultramontanism, a looking mm -hmm. over the Alps to the absolute authority of the Pope, or something like that. But the trouble is there isn't any good word. Uh, obviously, there are uh, Muslims, as there are in any other religion, who are more open, more critical, more um, less upset by challenges, and there are Muslims who become more quickly angry, who uh, absolutely maintain the validity of something. So, for want of a better word, I call that fundamentalism in uh, Islam, in, in Christianity, in Judaism, etc. But it's not a good word, and I, that I fully uh, agree with. And I would also, uh, you know, I'll accept Dr. Hattut's uh, gentle correction to an, to an extent here, but not, um, not uh, full blast. You see, I, I mean, I'm well aware of, you might say, the highly enlightened and sophisticated scholarly Arab, and not just Arab, but Persian, uh, Muslim, and, uh, say. Muslim uh, world, sure. And, uh, you know, uh, their, their contributions in philosophy with Averroes and Avicenna and the contributions in astronomy and in mathematics have been tremendous. But I would still say, oh, and I would also agree that Muhammad, unlike Jesus in the Christian tradition, has never been so hypostatized or apotheosized. So there's always been critical discussion in Islam, both in Shi and in Sunni, about the person of uh, Muhammad, what he did, uh, whom he married, uh, where he went, and what he said, and that's all been up for grabs in a way that it wasn't with Jesus until the 19th century revolution. But I would say beginning in about 860 with the suppression of the Metazolite school, the so-called rational mm -hmm. school of Islamic theology, there was a sense in which the Quran itself is off base for critical scholarship. Not that everybody held to the doctrine of the uncreated Quran, but for example, your testimony that somebody starts off to, with a red pen and is going to criticize and then is so struck by the beauty and the power, one could duplicate that. I mean, I do, I do not doubt that for a second. But one could duplicate that with, with any of the um, distinguished scriptures of the world, the Dhammapada, mm -hmm. the Bhagavad Gita. People make those same claims. I also agree that one can't um, really do the exegesis and the criticism properly without knowing Arabic and probably Persian at this, it also. But that's why I conclude my article that if and when the script, the, uh, the Quran is opened up critically, um, it will be done by Muslims. They're the ones, in the same way that it's Christians and Jews who did it with the Christian scriptures. Yet one has to know Greek, one has to know Hebrew, one has to know at least Arabic to do that. All that I agree with. But I would say the bottom line of this is that, there, that, that it has not been all open, critical scholarship in Islam. There's a sort of an untouchable core with the uncreated Quran. Well, and you I, conclude I, I your, think, uh, well, could, could that be, if we explored that further, could that be because <coughs> of a difference in the methodology as far as the science of, of, of the Bible and the Old Testament is, right from the beginning, there are several debates going on as to the origin of the language, as to how it was recorded, as to how it was translated. On, uh, and at many levels, this debate has raged through all these centuries. Uh, whereas if you go to the side of the Quran, it seems to me, fr I mean, from within, now I'm talking to you, right. and maybe we'll have Dr. Hatut, uh, that, that chain of possibilities does not exist because from day one, uh, the methodology has been established uh, much more clearly in, the, in, in broad daylight of history. Is that, uh, would that have? With the Quran? With the mean? Quran. So uh, now when you say that there is a critical view uh, and there is a fundamental view within Islam of uh, the origin of the Quran, I think uh, that, uh, that probably from, again from inside I'm talking, 
is uh, is probably not accurate because I think whatever the criticism is from within, it is not to uh, to say that the Quran was created or uncreated. No, I, would I, I would like to to respond to that in a way that makes it uh, probably clearer. We can talk about the authenticity of the Quran. That's one thing, and about the divinity of the Quran. The authenticity of the Quran, which means that this is the book that Muhammad delivered to the Ummah, to the humanity. I don't think that anybody argues about that, whether he's a Muslim or a non-Muslim. No, no serious scholar will, will say or, or need to do the historical criticism that's, for example, now people are talking who wrote the Bible and who wrote which Bible before what and how many Bibles were there and how many are left. I think all Muslims and non-Muslims agree on that. The other point is, which I, I noticed uh, also it is a point of disagreement between me and Dr. Crossley, is when we say the Quran is created, and there was, of course, the school that says Quran is eternal, and the school that says Quran is created, but both of them, both those two schools, never claimed that Muhammad created it. That's the point I was trying Be because it was, uh, they were talking a philosophical discussion about the technique of having this Quran. And some of them consider the Quran is eternal, meaning that it is the word of God, part of God, and God is eternal, and God is ancient before any ancient thing, and so the Quran is eternal, while others say, no, God created the Quran. But attributing Quran in the Muslim arena to anything about God never happened. Because, again, I go back to the issue of the language here. Mustafa Sadiq al-Rafi, who is a great uh, uh, critique and a great uh, scholar in Islam in about uh, 1919 and that period, he said that there are three kinds of talk, Arabic talk. There is poetry, there is regular, normal talks and writing, which is a nathr, and there is a third type, which is the Quran, which is neither nor. And uh, Muslims uh, traditionally were very comfortable that this Quran is different. And is, um, uh, of course, when I read the piece for Shakespeare, I can say it is different from the rest, the rest of, uh, of the English language. And so it can be attributed to Shakespeare. They're attributing it to Bacon also. Or to oh. Bacon. <laughs> Well, Islam, I've only read about it in books. So. I really haven't the slightest idea. So I guess peace would probably be what it means to me. Uh, in my opinion, it has nothing to do with terrorism. To learn more about Islam, be sure to watch Islam here every week at the same time. <laughs> In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful. O oh, ye who believe, if an evil liver bring you tidings, verify it, lest ye smite some folk in ignorance, and afterward repent of what ye did. And if two parties of believers fall to fighting, then make peace between them. And if one party of them doth wrong to the other, fight ye that which doth wrong, till it return unto the ordinance of Allah. Then, if it return, make peace between them justly, and act equitably. Lo, Allah loveth the equitable. O oh, mankind, lo, we have created you, male and female, and have made you nations and tribes, that ye may know one another. Lo, the noblest of you in the sight of Allah is the best in conduct. Lo, Allah is knower, aware. Three important verses where there are three basic teachings given for the social life. First of all, when you receive a news, somebody gives you some information, find out from where the information is coming. Don't just react to anything that you hear. Find out maybe a person who is giving the information, is he the right person? Is he telling the truth? Maybe he is twisting the point, he is not giving you the right information. So don't react against any group or against any individual simply after hearing a word. But make sure what you are hearing and from what source that is coming. Very important teaching. The second thing is, if two groups of believers, which is possible because they are human beings, even among believers the quarrels might come and they might fight. So the point is what to do in that situation. 
The teaching is that if you find two groups of believers fighting among themselves, try to bring reconciliation. Reconciliation is a very important teaching of, of the Quran. Bring peace between the people and especially among the believers, bring peace. Now it is quite possible that you try to reconcile but one party does not want to agree. Now after you made the decision and the one party is always is turning against it and they revolting it, then it becomes the duty to stand firmly with the party that is right and then also try to subjugate and bring it to the justice and to the righteousness the party that is refusing to listen. This is, uh, this is the way how you can bring uh, goodness and uh, reconciliation and peace within the believers. And finally, the third important uh, words here in this section is to emphasize the, the relationship that exists among all people, all mankind, regardless of their nationalities or colors or races, that is all people are created from one single pair, that is Adam and Eve. And God said, we have created you from a male and a female. And then we all became various nations and we became various tribes. But these, these variations of colors or variations of nationalities and races, this is not to despise each other, but rather to know each other, so that we may understand each other and we come closer to each other. And this is only for the sake of knowledge and for the sake of knowing that so and so comes from north and south, from one country, from one continent and from another place. But this, is, this does not say who is righteous and who is better because goodness does not lie in the color of the skin. The goodness does not lie in the what kind of blood we have in our veins. The goodness is what do we have in our character. The emphasis in Islam is that you are not good or bad because of what you are but because you are good or bad because of what you do. So, in akramakum indallahi atqaakum, the noblest of you, the best of you in the sight of God is the one who is the most pious among you, who is, the, who is the most righteous among you. And that is the criteria of nobility. Criteria of nobility is not the race, criteria of nobility is not the nationality, it is not what language you speak or what color you have. But criteria is how God conscious you are, how righteous you are. On behalf of the Islamic Information Service, thank you for watching and be sure to watch us next time. Assalamu alaikum.